So control layers, what, everybody know what a control layer is? Uh, really, it's those things that we want to provide environmental separation between two spaces that are conditioned differently. Uh, so they provide rain control, air leakage control, vapor diffusion control, and uh, heat transport control. Um, basically, in concept, we want to keep all moisture sensitive materials inboard those control layers. Um, so this, in this uh, slide, we have three images here. What sh they show what's been termed in the industry as perfect assemblies. And what that means are these assemblies can be applied to all enclosures in all climate zones and in all indoor environmental condition. So the backup structure uh, has the control layers outboard and then a rain screen or, and a capillary break or drainage layer outboard those control layers. So we're going to be looking at the practical side of the control layers and how we uh, control heat, sorry, not heat, heat's the next one, air, vapor, and water inboard those control layers. So obviously we want to design enclosures as best we can to separate condition spaces. Um, but in thinking about it, as Andrea talked about, we have a lot of problems in enclosures and the main problem that we oftentimes see is bulk water control. So bulk water management takes priority because it really influences the durability of the enclosure and uh, its susceptibility to deterioration. And if we have bulk water leakage to the interior, it's usually correlated with a direct failure of the enclosure to perform as intended. So um, bulk Bulk water is the biggest thing. Uh, second, and still very important, is air leakage, which usually goes hand in hand with the thermal control layer. And both of these are tied to energy efficiency and condensation. And then so much emphasis a few years ago, but not quite as major as big of an issue, since air carries a lot more moisture, um, we have vapor diffusion. So air, bulk water first, Air and heat second, vapor diffusion third. And then this is what we're going to cover in this presentation. So starting out um, with air leakage and its control. For the outline for this section, we're going to look at why we even think about air leakage, some of the requirements for air leakage in code language, what air barriers are. We're really going to talk a lot about interface details, and that's where we're going to get a little bit into the nitty gritty of things, and then some quality control during construction. So why is this even an issue? Why do we need to think about air leakage? Um, as Andrea mentioned, uh, a lot of what we look at are issues with building enclosures, and a, lo a lot of times that might be a condensation-related problem, as you see there in the photo on the left. Um, air carries moisture, so if we have in the wintertime in a cold climate condition, if we have interior air exfiltrating and reaching cold materials, we may get some condensation where we don't want it. And conversely, in a climate like this one, where we have summer air infiltration, we might have condensation on the interior of enclosure assemblies. Um, also, it's an energy efficiency issue since air carries heat. So. Thankfully, building codes have recognized this, and over the last 15 years, we've gone from having no requirements for opaque wall air tightness to requiring a continuous air barrier. So from 2000, we just had air leakage requirements for fenestrations, but no opaque wall. And now in 2015, and I don't think anything's changed in 2018, we have requirements for uh, opaque wall air tightness everywhere except climate zone 2B, which if you're familiar with the, the United States uh, IECC chart, is this small climate zone here. So the rest of the country needs to have a continuous air barrier assembly. And what the IECC requires um, is that um, for a material, it requires less than 0.004 cubic feet per minute of air leakage per square foot of enclosure assembly at 1.57 PSF pressure differential. 
Everybody got all those numbers memorized and ingrained in their head. Um, so where that 0 0.004 comes from is that is the air leakage rate for just a piece of drywall, and then it's orders of magnitude difference. So for then the assembly times 10.04 CFM per square foot at 1.57 PSF, and then for ASHRAE 90.1, we add the building to it. So it's less than 0.4 CFM per square foot at 1.57 PSF. And just to put that in perspective, uh, Army Corps is still 0 0.25. Has it changed? 0 0.25 CFM per square foot? Yeah. Question? OK, OK, thank you. So this is what um, codes require. Looking specifically at uh, fenestration air leakage rates, we have um, windows at 0.2 CFM per square foot or 0.3 at, so 0.2 at 1.57 PSF or 0.3 at 6.24 PSF. And then for curtain wall and storefront, we're at 0.06 CM, CF, CFM per square foot at 1.57. Sorry, that's a lot of uh, acronyms and numbers. Um, another guide that we have is this NAFS document, which is, a, is another resource that we have, and it helps define standard uh, basic requirements for windows. So if, you're f if, if anybody specifies windows, you might be familiar with this language, but we have all these performance classes. We have class R, L R, which is uh, formerly residential, LC, um, CW, and AW. And basically, these different performance classes correspond to gateway minimum design pressures for which they've been tested. Windows off also have different performance grades. So if you look at um, different uh, performance, so like, for example, an AW window ha could have different performance grades. And those are uh, designated by the design pressure for which they've been tested. Just one thing to note is that the IECC is a little bit more stringent than this NAFS document. Um, the air infiltration requirements for um, residential, light commercial, and CW windows less than 0.3 CFM, whereas IECC was 0.2. Um, and then for fixed AW or compression seal, we have less than 0.1. Storefronts, I'm going to go through these a little bit more qu quickly, but less than 0 0.06 CFM per square foot in the uh, AMA SF SMF manual. And curtain walls less than 0 0.06 at 1.57, which is the same as IECC. So getting into um, more of the section on materials and air barriers and assemblies. Um, so basically, Air barriers are not just a material. They're not just the fluid applied membrane. They're not just the self-adhered membrane that go on the opaque wall. They're the they're collection of materials, of systems that have to be designed and constructed to go together. And it's usually where things go wrong is the interfaces. So we're gonna talk a lot about interfaces and how to connect different systems. Um, but IECC, you can see the definition there for what an air barrier is, but the intent is that it, it uh, prevents air leakage through a building envelope. So it's a single material or it's a combination of materials that are interconnected. Air barrier requirements, they must be continuous across the thermal envelope. If they're not, you'll, you'll, we'll get into this in the building science section, but if you have a small hole, or a small gap in your air barrier, it can create a lot of problems. So it has to be continuous. Obviously, it needs to be air impermeable. Um, that's uh, definitely a requir requirement for an air barrier. It can't leak air. Um, there's a couple different tests shown there that uh, will help to give you the quantify the air leakage rate through materials. Um, air barriers need to be also supported. Other important properties that need to be considered, um, adhesion. So if, a, for example, a self-adhered or a fluid-applied membrane, if they don't adhere 
and they fall off your building, obviously that's not durable and they're going to not perform. They need to bridge crack. So for a fluid applied membrane applied to um, sheathing, if they crack at all the sheathing joints, then you're going to have air leakage and potentially water leakage at all those sheathing joints. Water penetration resistance, a lot of times air barriers are also functioning as a water resistive barrier. Um, you, that's usually the case, so we want them to resist water, water leakage. Water vapor permeability, depending on where the air barrier is located, many times they're also going to be a vapor barrier. And as I mentioned, durability is a big deal. So if it's not durable over the life of the enclosure and it, it's airtight and <coughs> continuous and ad well adhered from day one, but it's not at day 365, then um, obviously we're not going to get the air tightness requirements that the owner may be looking for. Other, thing, other things to consider, and we'll get into these a little bit later on, but UV resistance. A lot of air barriers are going to be exposed for a long time during construction, so how long can they be exposed? Um, also, they need to be covered. You can't leave air barriers exposed to UV. Application temperature, in-service temperature, if you have an air barrier below metal panel cladding and it melts and falls off your building, that's not a good thing. Thickness, we have to look at that for, especially for fluid applied membranes. When some materials require primer for your substrate. Some materials are combustible. Um, some materials are not compatible. For example, a PVC roofing system touching a rubberized, uh, rubberized asphalt air barrier system. Those may not be compatible. We have a lot of movements in building enclosures, so we have to think about how to detail those and what kind of movement uh, can air barriers accommodate. And then cladding penetrations. Obviously, our, all of our cladding has to be tied back to our backup wall structure. And how do we, are those air barriers self-sealing? Do we have to seal every, treat every one of them? Um, so all things to consider in the design specif specification ins installation of air barrier materials. So as I mentioned, uh, air barrier materials can be vapor permeable or impermeable. They oftentimes serve as the weather resistive barrier. There's a ton of different types out there, a ton of different manufacturers out there, each with its own properties and advantages and disadvantages. Um, but just as a FYI, there's, these are all the types that we have. Um, we're not going to go into detail on all of them. Most of this presentation is going to be geared around fluid applied or self-adhered sheets, but um, just know that we have mechanically fastened. I've seen a couple projects where we have insulated sheathing and that has to be detailed as well. Different advantages and disadvantages to those. Um, some of our cladding materials is also um, an air barrier assembly. So thinking about in wall systems where an air barrier is located, typically they're located uh, on the backup wall inboard uh, continuous insulation. It's easiest to make it continuous there. Um, it's integrated with your drainage cavity. Um, it can be located anywhere. Sometimes you think about, or some assemblies have the interior drywall as their air barrier, a little bit harder to do with all the penetrations through it. Um, usually it's in the same plane as insulation since both of those are dealing with um, heat. We also have to think about um, roofing systems and where the air barrier is located because that's a big part of where air leakage is going to occur. It could be the roofing membrane if it's adhered, if it's fully adhered. It could be the roof deck itself. It could be a separate membrane on top of the roof deck. In sloped ceiling or sloped roofing systems with a ventilated attic, it could be the ceiling itself underneath of the uh, the roofing system. I'm moving really fast here. Everybody's still with me. <laughs> One of the things to think about in um, looking at a design is where is the enclosure boundary? All right, it's good. Okay. So thinking about what spaces are conditioned, what are unconditioned, and what might be conditioned a little bit differently. So like thinking about a loading dock where it's got 
um, overhead doors continuously opening and closing that may not be conditioned as strongly as the adjacent um, office space, for example. Um, plenums or mechanical rooms that might not be conditioned. Podiums with garages, the garages aren't conditioned. So how do you separate the garage within the podium from the space above it? Uh, high relative humidity spaces, so like operating rooms, natatoriums, data centers, those all have to be separated, s separated from their adjacent spaces that are condi conditioned differently. So this is one example. Um, what should the enclosure boundary be in this plan? So we've got a loading dock next to a freight elevator, next to a storage room, and then thinking about what happens when the loading dock doors are open. So we could think about does, are two uh, enclosure boundaries necessary? Where does the air barrier need to be? Are we going to follow the yellow line? Or are we going to follow the blue line? Are we going to do both? So that's one thing you have to, in a design review, first consider is where's the enclosure boundary? Then we need to make sure an air barrier is clearly identified. I think this is pretty standard now, but not so long ago, there were a lot of drawings that we would see that it wasn't clear what the air barrier, what was the intended air barrier, it wasn't listed. So making sure the drawings clearly identify what it, the architect is intending for the air barrier to be. And then it's looking at the interface details. So providing enlarged details of transitions and then in illustrating that continuity. I think Andrea, you mentioned this, is that a lot of times it's by others. Well, that doesn't usually go so well. So we gotta look at those details and it's not always gonna be, um, ex show every part and piece, but it needs to show at least the intent of how to achieve that continuity. Um, and we'll get into a lot of this in just a second. The meat of the presentation is coming up with this, because this is the big deal, the interface details. Um, and if you're doing a design review, a really helpful thing is to be able to think three-dimensionally. It's easy to look at a two-dimensional detail on paper. So looking at, for example, in this detail, <clears throat> the shelf angle, where we have flashing up back up to the uh, air barrier, but what happens where that shelf angle terminates into the curtain wall? Um, how do we detail that assembly to be airtight, but also in this, we're gonna jump ahead to water management so that water just doesn't roll off the end of that shelf angle and dump into the curtain wall system. So three-dimensional um, mindset during design reviews is really, really helpful. Okay, so we're gonna have a bunch of different types of interface detailing. The first one I started with was uh, fenestration. So we'll talk about roof to wall, fenestration, overhangs, base of wall, shelf angles, a number of different interface details. But we're gonna start off with fenestration. So one of the things to really um, understand about reviewing fenestration details is where is the air and water line of the fenestration system itself? If you don't understand how fenestration manages air and water, it's really, I would almost say, not possible to understand how to detail an interface because you need to know where to create that seal. And that seal is usually created with, so the air barrier material on the backup wall. Let's talk about this one first. So the backup wall, Usually the air barrier is shown at the dash line. It usually wraps into the rough opening and then a sealant joint between the two. You need to know where to create that sealant joint. In all three of these, that sealant joint is shown wrong and we'll get into it. I'll show you this in a little bit, but just we see things all over the place in terms of how these are detailed. And in all three of these, we'll, I'll show you these details again later. We need to make some adjustments. But in other conditions, and I'll show you this, we have um, uh, membrane that actually gets glazed in or gets sealed to the uh, fenestration, but typically we'll see uh, sealant that is the bridge between the fenestration system and the air barrier membrane. 
So starting with storefront, storefronts are um, different than curtain walls in that they drain the water down to the bottom. So if we have four lights of curtain wall high, all of that water comes from the horizontals gets directed into the verticals and it drains all the way down to the bottom where there's a subsill, which is essentially like a through wall flashing that drains the water. So we assume that the exterior gaskets in the system allow water to penetrate into the glazing pocket. And then there's diverters at every horizontal to vertical interface. The horizontal members get sealed to the vertical members. And then there's a water diverter that directs it into the vertical and down into the glazing pocket to the sill and not into the interior. Does that make sense? Hopefully this diagram is a little bit, uh, explains it a little bit, but um, basically the thing to keep in mind is that every horizontal drains it all the way to the vertical, all the way down to the subsill and out. So the detailing of the subsill is critical. Um, here's just a quick image of the water diverter as well. Oops. So just a little quiz. This is a storefront window system. Which one do you think is correct de detailing of a jam? We're showing how, how a storefront jam would be sealed to an air barrier, adjacent air barrier. Take a look. I'll give you just a second. So we can, I'm not gonna do a poll because I'm not as technology savvy, sorry. Um, but we have, uh, oh shoot, I gave you away the answer. Oh, <laughs> so we have brick cladding or any sort of cladding. We have continuous insulation. We have an air barrier on our backup wall. And then we have metal stud backup. <clears throat> and here's our storefront. In the one on the left, we have a seal between our storefront and our cladding. We have a seal between our continuous insulation and cladding. And then we have a seal between our air barrier and storefront. B, we have um, similar, but we're sealing to our air barrier here. And C, we're sealing to the cladding, and then we're sealing to the drywall. Who says A? Everybody's going to be afraid to answer this. <laughs> Anybody say B? Anybody say C? Anybody not answering? <laughs> All right, so it was B. So basically, we have to make sure our air barrier wraps into the rough opening, our interior seal is to the air barrier, and then we have a, what we call a cavity seal between our cladding and our air barrier that any, any Water or air within our cavity is isolated from your storefront system. So this cavity seal also needs to be, if, remember I said think three-dimensionally, that cavity seal also needs to be integrated and detailed with our uh, subsill end dam. So all the subsills have end dams so the water doesn't run off the ends, and this cavity seal comes down and gets integrated with the subsill. Questions on that? Here's a picture. So this is the sink three-dimensionally. So this is a, a detail of a sill and jam coming together where we have our end dam on our subsill and our cavity seal coming down, integrating with that. We make sure to seal our end dam to at the end so that water running down comes into the sill pan and out. We have upturned back legs to manage the water. That's a little bit more into the water section, but um, really trying to give a continuous air and water seal. One thing to think about is how are these storefronts anchored? So again, th these aren't always shown in architectural details, but something to think about is how are, how are we detailing this? And I'll show some other examples in um, the water section, but are we, um, do we have anchors that come into the interior? And this is an example of that where how is our air seal created around that? storefront attachment. So they tried to do it in this condition where they have this sealant joint. Um, they're sealing, it looks like, right to the stud. But So this is actually the air barrier wrapping into the rough opening right here, the gray piece. 
Um, the sealant, the black seal is our air seal and they come around the anchor and they come down, they seal the fastener, fastener holes. But what about this right here? There's a gap between our storefront framing and our, on our anchor that seems like maybe it's not a big deal, but it is. We see a lot of issues at, the, at these. And we'll get a little into a little bit more of the subsill detailing um, with the water management section. So getting into curtain walls. Any questions on storefronts before I keep moving really, really fast through some of these sections? So curtain walls, stick, there's two types of curtain walls. There's stick built and there's unitized. Stick built systems, again, the horizontals frame into the verticals and they have a sealant joint between them. I'm trying to show here the critical seals between at the curtain wall system. So horizontal frames into vertical. The red is this critical sealant between the frame members. So that's the frame joinery. And then we have these um, zone dams that basically what happens, every light in the curtain wall manages water. The water comes down at every light. Every single horizontal is like a flashing system where it captures that water and directs it to the exterior. This is a pressure plated system. So this is our glazing pocket where water collects. There's weeps in the pressure plate that direct it out. So every single horizontal manages the water. <clears throat> our air and water line is this line here. And that is a critical thing to know about curtain wall design is that this is the line. In a lot of the forensic work that we do, this seal is either missing or improperly located, which is, allows a, a lot of air leakage, allows a, a lot of water leakage. And so getting this primary seal correct is a big deal. Um, a lot of times you're going to see just this seal and this seal and this one missing. Um, so interface details, this is one that gets done quite often. It can be done. Uh, the sealants can be mislocated. So here's showing a seal and the orange is so showing another option, which would be a sil silicone transition strip that actually gets glazed into the curtain wall. Two different ways to do it. Both work really well. I'll show some examples here in a bit that the difference between the two. Um, but again, the air and water line is this dash line, and that's critical to know for integration details. So there's just some views about how that actually looks in the field. Here's our zone dam getting sealed all around, our joinery seals, horizontals to verticals getting sealed. This is the screw spline where the, the uh, outer face and the top face get sealed so that this is guarding against any air or water penetration and they're critical. And when they go wrong, they leak. So just an example, at, um, this is another stick built curtain wall system where <clears throat> you can see that gap between the frame joinery and we get leaks at those a lot of times. Here's an example of where they uh, brought in a structural vertical seal to a horizontal pressure plate and they missed that seal there. They did not marry the interior gaskets. So again, that critical seal is right at the inside side of the glazing pocket. <clears throat> and you have to verify that that's continuous all the way around. So looking at, thinking three dimensionally from, this is a sill detail. How does it meet the jams? Make sure that they're in the same plane and doesn't have anything interrupting it. Um, and then onto the head, how is all of that continuous? And then thinking about, will the sealant adhere to an air barrier that wraps into the rough opening? Oh, wrong one. In this condition, we have a metal panel that's glazed in. So is that metal sill then has to be part of the air barrier system, right? Because it's interrupting that, se that sealant joint. It, it penetrates through it. So then that, that metal panel has to become part of the air barrier system. Is it bedded in sealant against the substrate? That should also be part of the air barrier system. How are the splices detailed in that silk panel so that it's also airtight? <clears throat> and here's an example of glazing in a silicone transition assembly. So in this example, we had a little bit of a bend. So here's our backup 
construction, our air barrier came around onto this uh, sheet metal piece here. And then our silicone transition assembly came glazed in and came back onto this closure piece. What could be a little bit difficult about this is it wanted to revert back to its original condition. And then in the field, all these were opening up. So I know they come with transition assemblies that are factory fabricated with that bend in them, which is really nice, a little bit more costly. But thinking about construction too, is we seal, we bed seal these silicone transition assemblies onto our air barrier. We glaze them in and seal them into the glazing pocket and then making sure over the life of the building that that adheres and stays adhered. And another thing to think about, and you have to think about this during the design phase and think three-dimensionally about how this is going to happen because if you have a stick-built assembly with a pressure plate, we have this um, screw spline is what this is called where the pressure plate gets fastened into. That screw spline comes up and it runs continuous to the top of the curtain wall. Well, that silicone transition assembly has to get glazed into that glazing pocket. So if the screw spline interrupts that seal, then we have a breach in our air barrier. So that screw spline has to get notched at the top and bottom of every vertical member so that our, at, so that our silicone transition assembly can run continuously. Any questions about stick-built curtain walls? Okay, so if you thought stick-built might be a little complicated, <clears throat> unitized curtain walls are even more so. These, these get really, really tricky, and I'm not going to go into the minutia of these, but just so you understand the complexity of an enclosure and all the things you have to think about, I'll kind of hit the high-level stuff. So a unitized system, rather than, so I should explain this, stick build is really they come in pieces and you put them together in the field and you glaze them in the field. A unitized system is the system that comes together to the field in panels and then you mate the parts. So the important parts of a unitized system, you'll hear the, the chicken head and these gaskets and then a starter sill with end dams and interior gaskets that all have to mate. Um, but the thing to note is that the chicken head line is the primary line. And then it has to, how that chicken head mates to the vertical gaskets is really important. And then thinking about where that unitized system terminates into the air barrier at its ends or at the top and bottom is really important. But here's the uh, photo of how that thing, that, how that crazy system goes together. And these are all unique, typically. They're very unique systems. So you have to really understand how the system is going to manage air and water to know how to detail it at its interfaces. By the way, I should say, for whoever's following along in the slides, <clears throat> they're there. They're just mixed up because we rearrange sections with the lunch break in between. So air is in the middle. <laughs> Sorry, I should have said that at the beginning. Anyway, so that chicken head, that chicken head line is here and how that interfaces with the vertical gasket. But then that chicken head, we have to think about, okay, when that comes and it meets the opaque wall, how is that detailed? Here's an example of that. There has to be an end dam and how that end dam is integrated with the air barrier. It's all super, super detailed and and it's three-dimensional, but it's all things that really need to be thought about because if you miss them, you have air leaks, you have water leaks, and eventually maybe a failure. These subsills for the unitized system also have splices, so you have to detail those everywhere. And one thing that I see get missed quite a bit is the sealant joint between the, the um, starter sill and um, the substrate. At every one of those splices, there's a little bit of a gap between the, the bridge for the starter and the, um, so, so you see this gap here? If the sealant between the, the substrate and your starter is not married to this seal, then you have a gap at every single one of those. Uh, any questions about unitized? <clears throat> 
very complex systems. Okay, so just thinking a little bit more about integration details. Now that you kind of have a little basic background on where the water is managed. So again, in your curtain wall system, here's your management line. It's this inside side of glazing pocket. Here we go. This is an example of your air barrier outboard, your continuous insulation. Those two just don't meet. That was never designed. An example again, so I should zoom, I wish I could zoom in on this. Um, this seal, this critical seal, so the air barrier should be wrapping into the rough opening. This is your critical seal. It was just totally missed. Um, this is a curtain wall interfacing a precast wall. So a precast wall has two lines of defense, typically uh, at the at the joints. You have an inner primary seal and outer rain screen seal. So the, the seal that you need to marry to is this one. Um, we have an expansion joint here, which gets a little bit more complicated, but they kind of drew this pretty generically, but that critical seal is back here. And how are we going to marry that to our critical seal for the precast? <clears throat> Looking at um, terminations on, t on the bottom of a curtain wall where you have a soffit condition. So here they're insulating the bottom of the slab. Oh, wrong button. They're insulating the bottom of the slab with, uh, I believe, closed cell spray foam. This is a vented, uh, vented soffit condition. There's no connection between the uh, spray foam and the glazing pocket of the curtain wall. And you might argue for this case, so there's a back pan at the spandrel that should be airtight, and there's fire safing between the back pan and the edge of slab, and maybe you're arguing that that fire safing is your air seal. Um, it could, because you have mineral wool, and then you usually have a smoke seal, which is sealant, so if it's done really, really well, it could be part of the air barrier system, but then you have to think about all of the uh, curtain wall anchors that it's going to meet. Uh, you have to think about how your back pan returns into your curtain wall um, glass openings and how you get that smoke seal into your back pan. It's all super complicated, again, very three-dimensional. But thinking about continuity of this is a big deal. Instead, it would be a lot easier to do a connection out here provided you have access to it if you think about construction sequencing. Did I miss anything there? Does anybody see anything else? Oh, yes, thank you. So vertical members for a stick-built curtain wall. The, let me go back and show you in a detail here really quick. Sorry, so in a vertical curtain wall, this is interior space, and it runs the full, sometimes the full height of the building. It has splices oftentimes and whatnot, but in a soffit condition, <clears throat> if interior air is running through this condition, uh, in, you're going to have a direct air leak. So if you were relying on your smoke seal to be your air barrier, you also have to think about what, you know, the connection between the vertical tubes and your soffit, and you have to make that air seal. So if these extended even further down, and this is getting really, really into the weeds, if you extend that further down, you know, here you might just put the air seal here. If you put the air seal here, your thermal plane comes out, so you really want your air seal at your thermal plane. That's really getting into the weeds, but all things you need to really think about on how the, the when a curtain wall extends past your thermal plane, either at the roof side or at the soffit, at a soffit underneath, they get highly complex. And I'll show that an example here shortly. This is another example where a soffit detail, they originally were sealing to the back pan and the back side, but what happens on every single vertical? So the and we'll get into this thermal bridging in another section, but these are thermal bridges, so the detail was revised to add some insulation and an air seal to the bottom side. Oh my 
similar concept, just no connection between the soffit and the underside. Okay, so getting into overhangs or soffits um, or canopies, these are other conditions where the air seal is oftentimes missed. So <clears throat> in this detail, there was no, absolutely no seal between, here's the storefront head, here's a ventilated soffit, and no connection between the storefront head and the roofing system. So this is what we, we were called out during the construction phase to try to help reverse quality, quality assurance, quality control, no tie-in. So these soffits would have had air leakage and probably some condensation issues had they not installed a seal between the top and the, and the roofing system. And another thing to think about, um, and these are these are over or these are uh, extensions in both section and in plan, where the, um, the here we're showing a section, but where the insulation wraps around. This is kind of a, a good detail for continuity, but what happens a lot of times is that your thermal plane wants to sort of short circuit. So it might be a better idea to put your air barrier plane in this line, in line with your thermal layer, so that interior air, like in a cold climate condition, if you have interior air getting out into here, and these are probably going to be a little bit colder, um, you wouldn't have condensation issues. So a different idea that probably would work a little bit better is the air barrier and insulation plane here, and then this becomes vented. Sometimes you might have plumbing or electrical, or sorry, not electrical, but plumbing in here that needs to be heated. So that's another consideration, but you know, there's a lot of different things you could think about there. Um, so roof to wall detailing, um, a lot of things to think about. And here, the, um, the wall air barrier is just not at all connected. It just stops. So how do we connect between the roofing system and the air barrier system? You have to think about, obviously, continuity, compatibility. A lot of roofing systems are not compatible with air barrier systems. Constructability, and that's two different trades. Sequencing, two different trades. Thermal bridging in, a, in the roof-to-wall interfacing is, is a big deal. And then accommodating deflection, especially in the balloon-type framing where the wall rides independent of the roof. You have to think about how to accommodate all of that. So here's an example with platform framing, which is slightly different than balloon, or slightly more complicated than balloon framing, or slightly more simple than balloon framing. So, sorry. The, uh, the metal studs stop, the metal deck supported on the, on the metal stud wall. We have the roofing vapor retarder is integral with the wall air barrier. So we have a, a good air seal here. We also extend our air barrier up and our roofing membrane comes up and over to, to also create a good uh, water management system. What's complicated by this is that um, this requires two sequences. We have a wall air barrier, then we have to go roofing vapor retarder, and then we have to come back and do wall air barrier, then we have to come back and do roofing membranes, so it gets pretty complicated with sequencing. <clears throat> we have to think about the roofing membrane might not be compatible with the uh, uh, air barrier. Um, we have to think about, um, in this case, we don't have to think about deflection, but in, in a balloon framing, where the metal studs run past the wall, we'd have to think about deflection accommodation. We also have to think about how <clears throat> in, um, in a cold climate, for example, the thermal plane comes up and around. It may want to short circuit it, so we want to maybe provide an air seal between our roof deck and our um, backup, or our roof deck and our air barrier so that interior air can't get up in this and condense, so a lot of times we have to have an air seal here. Um, here's an example of where this, this didn't happen. So in this example, our continuity is created with this 
spray foam on the backup wall, a transition membrane up and over the backup wall to the roofing membrane. Here's an example of where this didn't happen. So they took the air barrier up to the top of the wall. They took the roofing membrane up and over the wood blocking that um, on top of the wall, they didn't ever tie these two together. In a brick, brick assembly, that brick has a lot of water in it. After it rains, the sun comes out, dries it inward. The cladding, uh, the cavity behind the cladding gets really hot and humid. This, in this particular building, which was in Illinois, so you wouldn't think of a summertime problem necessarily, but it had um, river, uh, negative pressurization pulling air inward. And so in the summertime, it was pulling this cavity air inward at all of these gaps in the top track of the metal stud wall, pulling it in, and we had severe condensation in the ceiling plenums on all the cold pipes. So connecting these is really, really important on how to do that and then um, prevent condensation problems from happening due to air leakage. Um, I've only got four minutes left, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go a little bit quicker here and go to curtain wall parapets. So we talked about soffits. Parapets are the similar with curtain walls. We have vertical tubes that run continuously with interior air. So in a cold climate condition, if interior air is in these tubes and gets up into the parapet, so many problems with condensation. So we have to think about isolating those interior tubes within the tube at the roof line. We have to think about the air seal between the curtain wall and the roof edge. And right here, they're, 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 they're using a smoke seal, fire safing and smoke seal to do that here integrating it with the back pan, figuring out how to do it at um, all the curtain wall anchors. And then the roofing membrane comes up and over and gets glazed into the glazing pocket. And Andre, I think this is one of your projects where the way it was resolved, instead of having to think about all those air seals, was actually breaking the curtain wall at the roof line, glazing into the chicken head, and then how does that interface with the parapet wall beyond, but the roofing vapor barrier, roofing membrane comes up, integrates, the frame was broken, this is a unitized system, it gets integrated down here so that the air seal doesn't have to be created at the very top. Deflection is a big deal, so where curtain walls are have a wind load anchor at the roof slab and they're riding up and down compared to the roof deck, you have to know about what is the anticipated differential movement between the curtain wall and the roof deck. Um, and then we have to accommodate for that deflection. And this is a sketch of how that was done here with a big backer rod. The roof deck or the roof in membrane comes up over the backer rod and gets glazed in to allow that <laughs> curtain wall to move differentially compared to the um, compared to the roof deck. And if you don't include some of these details, the long-term durability of the air barrier could be compromised because. Who knows, was that gonna tear away? Is it gonna pull out of the glazing pocket? Is it gonna eventually uh, fail and allow air leakage? Um, lower roofs to, to rising walls. Again, we have various membranes and uh, materials that make up our air barrier. Here it's the roof vapor barrier transitioning to the roofing membrane transitioning to a steel angle, transitioning to the air barrier. And how is that achieved? You know, how does that all come together at a shelf angle there that has splices in it? Just a different way to do it and making that connection down low between the air barrier and the vapor barrier. And then the roofing comes up and transitions to a flashing that gets detailed back to the air barrier. So this one's a little bit better for construction sequencing and constructability, but then the mason has to come in twice and uh, to do this to do this sequencing because they got to tie into the vapor barrier. Then the roofing comes in, and then they've got to tie into this roofing system. The base of wall details are always tricky, especially at the bases of doors. Integrating with the below grade waterproofing. Here we've got the base of the curtain wall tying into the air barrier 
with the silicone transition membrane, air barrier tying, tying into the below grade waterproofing, and how are those materials compatible? And how is this sequenced? And how is it protected during construction? Here's an example of compatibility uh, being an issue. This is at a base of a wall where we have waterproofing coming up and uh, wrapping onto the bottom of a curtain wall where there is, a, a, in curtain wall systems, there's a lot of silicone that's used. Um, so you have to think about how materials will bond to it. And in this example, nothing bonds to silicone except silicone. So in this example, they wrap up and onto it, and every single one of these joints, which occurred, I think, here every five feet, was open. So air leak issue, water leak issue at every one of those joints. <clears throat> How are we on time? OK, seven minutes till lunch. I will keep going through these integration details. Um, shelf angles are pretty challenging, and these, these are these are complex things to describe on paper and with pictures, but there's a whole slew of issues that come with them. So continuity of insulation. Oftentimes, shelf angles are getting pulled off the backup assembly with these clip angles. So this is an example of a clip angle assembly pulling off the shelf angle. They're not showing insulation here, but the insulation plane is, is, is right here. The air barrier system comes down, laps onto the flashing and out also comes down and gets wrapped into the rough opening. It also gets, actually it gets uh, glazed into the curtain wall. We have a seal between our shelf angle and our uh, curtain wall system. But in just thinking about um, shelf angle detailing, um, one thing to consider is where that splice occurs. If the splice occurs too far back, to the backup wall, you have to detail every single one of those splices to be airtight and watertight because it becomes part of the air barrier system. If you pull the splice out far enough, then the, this air barrier just has to lap onto one clip angle instead of two clip angles because these are back-to-back -back, uh, T's sometimes, they're back-to-back -back clip angles sometimes. If that overlap occurs too far back to the backup system, it laps onto both of those, and then the splice between those all have to be detailed. Sometimes then the anchor bolts also have to be detailed. If we can pull it out far enough, then we only have to detail one clip angle, which makes it much more simple. Um, let's see. Here's an example of this with the standoff clips at every floor line um, and how complicated this got. So here we, we pulled it out the the splice out far enough where it only had to lap on to this clip angle. It didn't have to get onto this one, but we had joints to detail between the window buck and the backup wall that behind the shelf angle you could hardly get to. So you had to think about constructability on, on this one. And here's how that looked in the field and how really messy that got. So we got our flashing system, which was a two-piece so that they could accommodate construction tolerances and move that shelf angle around. Our air barrier lapped onto the flashing. Our insulation was continuous behind it. Then what happens when that shelf angle ends? Here's an example where they tried to use um, steel tubes to pull off the angles. So each of these plates was welded to a steel tube that was anchored to the backup and our air barrier came down here. So air barrier had to be detailed around all of these steel tubes and there was no access to do that. So getting that good air, air and water seal behind these plates was very difficult to achieve. Here's where it just never happened. So they just sort of forgot. No air seal whatsoever. Deflection joints. So all of these are really, really challenging details. Deflection joints are one of them. Um, <clears throat> deflection joints at edges of slabs accommodate differential movement between the structure and the wall. And here's an example of this provided at a insulated sheathing. We have a strip of butyl tape 
at every deflection joint, every single floor line. The air barrier system had a silicone flashing membrane. And so we had to think about construction sequencing. So remember I said nothing bonds to silicone but silicone. So we, they started out this project where they were sealing all the joints, working from bottom to top, and then they'd come and tape their joints, and then they'd come up and keep sealing as they go. Well, nothing stuck here. They didn't, couldn't seal to the silicone, so they had to come back and they had to seal all this, all the uh, bottom of the butyl tape. So thinking about compatibility and sequencing is a big deal. Also, at a, another thing to think about with deflection joints is a lot of times they're going to align. They they align with the bottom of the slab. If you have a storefront system that aligns with the bottom of the slab as well, how is the storefront head going to transition into a deflection joint detail? Or should I say, how does the deflection transition into the rough opening of the storefront head? Um, you can see they didn't do it here. So it's, let's see, here's our deflection joint. They didn't really show it. They didn't really detail it very well. It's aligned with the head. It's supposed to wrap into the rough opening to accommodate that deflection so that it doesn't open up long term. I think this is my last uh, interface detailing issue. So all of these are where we oftentimes see things go wrong, louvers and plenums. <clears throat> um, plenums are part of the exterior. A lot of people will say, you know, my louver is uh, going to resist rainwater penetration, but they, they leak. <laughs> and obviously, they leak air. So a plenum has to be designed to be air and water tight. So for all the mechanical engineers in the room, this is when the collaboration happens a lot of times, knowing what kind of ducts are coming into here. Or if we have, so if we have a ducted uh, louver, how does the louver, or how does your duct interface with the um, blank off panel for our louver, and how does the blank off panel integrate with the sill pan flashing for the louver system? All of that needs to be designed because this is a lot of times where it goes, this is a lot of times missed because a lot of times it's shown partially on the mechanical drawings, some on the architectural drawings, and then coordination needs to happen between those two. Oh, and one other thing, a lot of plenums are big and they have columns in the middle of them. They have drains, too, to, to take the water, but they have columns in the middle of them. So how do we detail our air barrier or our roofing system to be air watertight around every single one of those columns? <clears throat> OK, so those are interface details. And there's a lot of stuff to digest there, I'm fully aware. but. We see it, those are the, the big ticket items of where things go wrong uh, in terms of detailing. <sighs> Going into construction and quality control during construction, there's other things to think about as well. Um, some of them are surface preparation. So a lot of the fluid applied systems require you know, a struck flush mason, uh, CMU, um, how to detail it at all the wa wall ties, um, installation temperatures, UV exposure, it's starting to alligator and crack, um, primate, primer, here's an example where the wasn't struck flush and so having a bunch of open seams where they're uh, protruding. Coordination with trades. <clears throat> Everyone likes to poke holes in the air barrier. A lot of times, air uh, holes get poked after the cladding is already installed. So how do you get back to seal them? Uh, in this, in one of these cases, luckily our air barrier is still exposed, so we could probably get some good seals there. And this is an exaggerated uh, example, but hitting the studs when you're installing your cladding anchors. A lot of times that doesn't happen and you just keep trying, well, every one of those needs to be sealed. Um, sequencing and compatibility. So um, thinking about how this is an example of where we're bonding a rubberized flashing to silicone. 
and nothing bonds to silicone. <laughs> so it's also reverse lapped, so we have um, issues that I don't even know how many punched openings there were. And all of this is stuff you want to catch in the design review or talk about in the design review. You can't get everything, which is why we would like to do also site visits because it allows us to see everything up close. Not everything's detailed in three dimensions, so we resolve these in the field. Again, the sequencing and compatibility issues. I already talked about that one. Um, lap joints, we have um, open fish mouths, so we got wrinkles in the air barrier. We've got penetrations there. We did some testing. We can see the bubble showing that there's an air leak. Um, adhesion, we didn't adhere at any of these where it's in all, all of these locations where we did testing, we had a failure. Uh, continuity. As I mentioned in the integration details, continuity is key. It doesn't always happen even when you get to the field. So just an example of getting glazed into a curtain wall system. We have a, this transition assembly and with a termination bar wrinkle right up through the termination bar and open joint leaks air. Um, application. So a lot of times you have to seal. I'm almost done, Stephanie. You have to seal. Seal these, <laughs> the fastener, if you countersink the fasteners, how are, those are usually required to be detailed. Some systems have a mesh at the joints and they have to be embedded. Fluid applied systems have to be done thick enough. Um, protection during construction, welding, burning off the, the membrane, ropes over the parapet, uh, damaging during construction big thing to think about moisture so if you're working up the wall and you, it rains and you leak and you've got moisture trapped it's trying to get out it blisters the membrane so um, and I'm not going to go into testing but just know that there's a lot of different field tests that are covered in a separate module so we have um, qu quantitative testing qualitative testing um, and whole building testing that is covered under a separate module. And that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> How'd I do on time? Five minutes. Any questions before we take a quick lunch break? And we'll get into vapor diffusion, which is towards the end of the slides in the packet that you have. Yeah, so for design reviews, certainly we will point out details that are, are we think should be done. Um, but after, so the way I practice, and I think it's probably pretty typical, and you guys can chime in, I ask for meetings after design reviews to discuss issues. Otherwise, it's, you know, it's really hard to describe these details, and I apologize if I didn't do it very well, but in a design review, if you write all this, it's easier to get together face to face and just work it out. So I do try to do that. Otherwise, issues don't get resolved. Yeah. Yeah, it's required, and IECC 2015 requires it, except in one climate zone, 2B, which is the little area I showed in, I think, Arizona. Where did people get the idea? Right? Oh. Well, I, I have a question for you, is how do you simulate it? I mean, because that is a big effect, I think. Like, you could just guess 0.8 CFM for really air leak, air leaky building. Um, yeah, so. But if, if. California does have some weird 
I would just say then, like, what's the difference in the air leakage rate? Because they can't, I don't know that they can give that to you. I don't think that there's a way to actually do that. No. I start with using mandatory Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. It's not like a, a no. thing that comes out and says you're okay. But for like, if you can relax on insulation if you have a much more explosive model. So yeah. I think the confusion of the yeah. decision is that just get a model that just gives you last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not, there's nothing that I know of that says you can trade that off. Anything else? I'll be around and available if you are confused on any of that. Let me know. Happy to chat further. Guess we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, start back up anyways. Give Elizabeth a little break here mm -hmm. at least. Uh, touch on vapor diffusion. Um, as the slide says, um, we're going to uh, first just a little outline of what we're going to cover. Again, uh, concerns that we have with vapor diffusion, um, vapor retarder requirements. To, that help to control diffusion and touch on different assemblies that we'll see vapor retarders in, uh, slab on ground, roofing, and walls. Um, first off, getting in there, uh, vapor, of course, being um, uh, water and gas, gas phase. Um, comes from multiple sources, outdoor, obviously. Um, Humidity, which uh, comes from Colorado. This is a different, higher humidity level than what I'm used to on a day-to-day -day -day basis. Um, but uh, also it comes from other local sources, as you can see in the image on the right here, um, where during construction service uh, or construction, as well as through the life of the project, you could have localized microclimates that can add to that humidification. Also from the interior, obviously uh, pools, fountain spas, botanic gardens, um, etc. cetera, uh, working all the way down to even your, your standard house there, which may be a two or three bedroom um, room, but still may have multiple occupants. Those occupants have to shower, cook, clean, etc. all affecting um, different uh, humidity levels in different parts in, of the house. Um, in terms of uh, vapor diffusion, what that is, is um, of course it's a transmission caused by a differential um, air temperature um, and that's fed also by the humidity um, flying f or flowing from higher density air to lower density air. Um, so there in the hot humid climates flowing primarily from the exterior to interior. Um, cold, humid climates, uh, interior to exterior, and then we'll touch a little bit. I know we talked about before uh, about mixed climates where you get it going both ways depending on what time of year it is, etc. Um, and in terms of vapor control, how do we keep that in, in touch there? I mean, we use vapor retarders, which we'll get into exactly, uh, but mainly I just wanted to touch here too is we want to focus on um, when that diffusion of moving from higher to lower density air, when you hit that dew point temperature, et cetera, and then you get into big problems when you can't dry that assembly out correctly or adequately. Um, vapor retarders, um, by definition, they're slowing or trying to control that vapor transmission. Um, by air leakage is another matter, again, that we've touched on before. Um, ASTM E96 is really what uh, defines what level of uh, vapor retarder you have and what's a vapor retarder in general. Um, the code has three classes, uh, the heavy duty ones, um, um, putting a stop sign really almost, 
um, on vapor transmission is at class one with uh, 0.1 perm or less. Uh, then a step up there, the class two um, spanning between 0.1 and one perm. And then class three, a little uh, vapor retarder light really is at uh, uh, greater than 10, um, or I mean between one and 10 perms. Um, a class one vapor retarder is termed a vapor barrier. That's something we run into quite a lot, um, which you can correct in conversation, of course, but when you have those written into your specifications and you're calling out a vapor barrier, um, there are specific definitions for that, which could have, you know, potentially have some serious ramifications. So it's important to keep track of that. Um, the code, um, going back to that humidity and the outdoor relationship in terms of that uh, vapor drive. Um, the code assigns vapor barrier requirements with respect to your locations and climates. Um, specifically here, uh, class one vapor retarders uh, are not supposed to be used on the interior side of frame walls um, in zones one through four, um, except for marine four. And class two vapor retarders uh, not to be used on the interior side of frame walls um, in zones one or two. Um, you can use them in uh, zones five, six, seven, and eight, and marine four. Um, and there's exceptions to that as well, listed there. Um, and just examples of what these are in practice in terms of your, your full on vapor barrier, that class one vapor retarder. You're, of course, uh, everyone thinks of polyethylene sheet. Um, sheet metal, of course, uh, non perforated aluminum foil and foil faced insulation sheathing. Um, and class two materials, uh, looking at craft faced insulation, um, unfaced, rigid in a lot of instances, and uh, some low perm paint. And class three, um, latex paints, enamel paints. Now, in terms of when to use these, I mean, this, it seems like vapor barriers and, you know, that, that always seemed to be how you solve the, the envelope. And Elizabeth touched on, you know, the importance of all of the different elements that we're trying to control in terms of separating interior and exterior and vice versa, really. Um, but it seemed like in the past, that's, that's, this was the focus on it. Um, so in terms of analysis, uh, the dew point or glazer method is what uh, tend, tended to drive the design of the exterior enclosure. Um, since then, we've got a little bit uh, more savvy in terms of our analytical models uh, going into hydrothermal analysis, which we'll touch on here a bit. Um, and that's, that's what I like to always say is that, you know, you should analyze it. You can't really manage it if you can't measure it or at least approximate it. Um, but there are those rules of thumbs where you really have to have them. And those are those, uh, those floor slabs on grade, uh, below grade walls, um, where you have those um, more severe interior climates um, with natatoriums, museums, where you have a higher relative humidities. Uh, same for book archives and uh, healthcare uh, facilities of uh, certain programs, um, as well as concrete roof decks. And uh, never having them in two locations in the wall assembly. I know we talked about with the air barriers, for instance, you could have one, two, go beyond. That's, that's fine depending on their uh, permeance. But uh, when you're, you're talking about uh, vapor diffusion, you wanna allow some, afford some drying potential for that wall assembly. Um, I was mentioning analysis, uh, dew point temperature. It's, uh, it's what, uh, at least in architecture school, uh, some engineering schools, I mean, that's what uh, you're doing by hand. Uh, it's a steady state. It's along one single line through that wall assembly. You're accounting for heat flow and vapor diffusion as it relates to that. Um, you're paying attention to where that material temperature uh, goes below that dew point temperature, um, which of course is where you have that air temperature where that relative humidity hits that saturation point and where water will condense. Um, shortcomings, um, it's, it's fairly simplified. You're assuming a constant daily temperature. It's pretty approximate. You're not taking into account some complexities that we'll get into for the uh, um, 
hyperthermal analysis. And that's also a 1D analysis. Um, you're looking at that line through that wall assembly. Um, but you're accounting for seasonal and diurnal uh, wetting and drying of the assembly. You're accounting for that complex interaction of those um, uh, cladding reservoirs such as brick where it's porous enough to take on moisture, but then when it heats up, it can expand and you have some complex interaction between that capillary moisture movement and then humidification of that cavity between that cladding and your actual wall that's trying to do all the work with moisture and vapor control. Um, typically, um, at some at quite a few locations within the program, they're using about three years of weather data and files, like actual weather data, um, which accounts for, again, those seasonal and diurnal wetting and drying. You have the ability to tune the knobs a, a little bit and pick which elevation you're getting to approximate, you know, that that solar incidence, you have some shading, that wetting, you can account for, you know, the if you have extended eaves that you get a little bit more drying potent or uh, coverage there from the moisture hitting directly on that surface and whatnot. But um, that's, although that's a pro, having all those knobs to kind of tweak, um, unless you know what you're doing, um, it can, it has a high potential for garbage in, garbage out kind of thing. Uh, sometimes you also have a little lack in uh, weather data and also materials. Some manufacturers want to be uh, a little closer to the chest on uh, sharing that information that you need for that input, although it seems like more and more um, are offering that material database to actually go with that uh, updates for the program. Um, and regardless of what, what program or what analytical method you do, one, one thing that I always like to say is it's good for accounting your permeance of each material that you have through that assembly. So you understand what, what's actually happening in that assembly. You can, can deal with that misplacement um, of vapor barriers. Uh, also, sometimes they're too impermeable. Um, and more to the point, uh, double vapor barriers where you deal with that moisture entrapment, um, including an, adding in inverted vapor barriers. You might call out something that, hey, this is my, my vapor retarder in the wall, and you're calling out something else as your, your air barrier, for instance. But that air barrier may have a permeance low enough where it's actually doing the work as your, your vapor barrier as well. And uh, one of those items, ball wall, Vinyl wall co coverings um, on the inside of air-conditioned assemblies, of course, are notorious, as that previous Emma showed. Um, the common defects, um, vapor barriers, uh, they don't need to be perfect to work necessarily. I know we showed this as a bad thing on uh, the air uh, barriers. Um, it's a little bit more forgiving um, with vapor barriers. Um, Slab-on grades, again, we were talking about uh, the rules of thumb where you always need to have it. Um, and this is why, I mean, especially when you're looking with direct applied flooring, can have some moisture sensitive materials, uh, mold growth, etc. Obviously, uh, when you're talking about a gymnasium floor, for instance, uh, it's always a good idea to use uh, floating flooring where you're having sleepers go across. So most of those moisture sensitive boards in that gym floor aren't uh, really taking a brunt of uh, moisture intrusion. And in order to ensure that, um, again, this isn't a field testing module necessarily, but it's, it's worth mentioning that uh, always good to test before, not after. Here you could see the uh, test probe um, going through. They had to core through the gym floor just to see what the, what the heck was going on with these buckling um, flooring members. Moving upwards to the uh, uh, roofs, um, on concrete roof decks, we have the same potential issues with um, roofs uh, where you have a concrete structure and the contractors itching to get the, the roofing assembly on. Um, you wanna be paying attention to, to how and when that, uh, that moisture will be released in terms of curing, not, not necessarily drying there, but you wanna focus on that water cement ratio as that, that cures throughout um, its lifespan until it reaches that, that um, full strength, quote unquote, and coordinate that with your, your contractors uh, 
phasing. Um, also taking into account uh, the time of year and weather conditions when you're, you're going after that berry for very similar reasons. Um, looking at uh, your substrate material changes, um, you can see on the left here, we're going from a concrete on metal deck and jumping down to, um, could be an addition, could be new construction that has uh, a different makeup roof assembly for whatever reason. Um, but you want to make sure that substrate is continuous enough to apply that vapor control air. I think we mentioned too the, the vapor retarders that you get a little bit too impermeable and uh, using on the interior side of a reservoir cladding such as the brick um, that we talked about before, but not just brick, other materials as well, feeding that microclimate and, and vapor drive. And of course, the, the vinyl face uh, wallpaper um, can look nice if you select it correctly, I guess, but um, it also can wreak havoc as well in terms of the actual function. So here's something in a, you know, just a brief uh, peer review example. Um, you're looking at uh, brick over CMU wall uh, construction where you have your brick, brick veneer, um, have a little bit of an airspace. Um, two inches of outboard rigid um, XPS, and then eight inches of CMU block um, with a little bit more interior insulation. Um, have some Z furring to attach the, the, the wall board that finishes on the interior, but also on the interior too, you're ending up with an inch and a half of uh, poly ISO. Um, and then you have your, your vapor barrier as well. So, I mean, a lot of times these multiple vapor barriers uh, happen by accident. accident. Um, again, they don't necessarily have to be perfect uh, to be effective, but um, again, you can have some limited drying potential with those multiple vapor barriers. And then in another wall assembly, um, this kind of leads to what I was saying earlier. Um, here you have the four inches of CMU veneer, um, uh, airspace and then the fluid applied air barrier membrane applied onto exterior sheathing, um, six inches uh, studs uh, with um, bat insulation and then you have that interior vapor barrier um, with your being capped off on the interior with five eighths inch uh, jet board and again that that fluid applied air barrier membrane we're not really specifying if it's vapor permeable vapor semi permeable or whatnot, maybe that's, maybe that's called out in the specifications, but it's always a good idea to have them in, in both locations and coordinate those, but um, needs to be explicitly called out. All right, Did you put this back? Okay. Okay, can you hear me now? All right. One thing to just to touch on this slide, we have a potential vapor barrier here and we certainly have one here. If we're not perfect and we can't ever be perfect, if you get water in between those, it's stuck, it can't dry. So that's why that is something to be aware of. Um, so we, I know I've done a lot of talking already today. I will try to make this easy to understand, but it's, it's easier. Bulk water leakage, I think, is easier than air uh, tightness because it's a lot easier to control uh, bulk water leakage than it is to control air leakage. So hopefully this one uh, is not as super, super technical. <laughs> um, anyway, outline for the bulk water leakage control, I'm gonna look at basically one, two, three, four, five, six types of assemblies and how they control water leakage. So opaque walls, fenestration, low slope roofing, slope roofing, below grade waterproofing, and expansion joints. Um, I have uh, the WRB here grayed out because usually the WRB, which stands for weather resistive barrier, is usually the air barrier. And so that was covered if you missed it, 
an hour ago. <laughs> so I won't be de delving into that one as much because that really the integration details and that was in the previous discussion. So uh, why is this important? Uh, Andrea had this slide. Um, obviously, if there's a water leak, owners usually don't like that. Um, so we try, we try to avoid it. Um, in general, for most opaque wall assemblies, fenestrations, joints, um, any sort of enclosure assembly, the best way to control water leakage is the dual line of defense approach. Um, so the inner, this, line, this red line here that we're showing is the prime, what we would call the primary seal, um, which I would call sort of a backstop. And then the blue line here is um, the outer, the shield, um, so sort of the rain screen line. So this, this detail shows the dual line of defense approach. This line is to sort of shield against most of the water. This line is just to prevent it from getting in. This line can almost never be perfect, so we want to make this one as perfect as possible so that we mitigate any water entry. The other thing is that this outer line, it shields from uh, UV and we have insulation outboard of it. So um, we're shielding the primary line against those thermal changes and so that helps with the durability of the inner line. So that's the general concept of how we really want to think about water. Yes? Do you know that the Tommy Johnson correct as far as the CMB? Your line is correct. My line is correct. You want, you're talking about this, this, this one right here? <laughs> you want to talk about it? So, this line, so remember what I said about this primary line is always on in the inside side of the glazing pocket or what some people will call the shoulder of the curtain wall? The primary line's right here. See where they're showing it? They're showing it here sealed to the pressure plate of the curtain wall to sealed to the insulation layer. So that's not in the right place. I didn't, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Thank you. So that, that is showing primary gone wrong. And then secondary is fine. It's shown to the snap cover and the um, rain screen. Sometimes people will get a little bit bent out of shape about that because it's a maintenance issue for a curtain wall. If you have to deglaze for any reason, your seal is to the snap cover. So it's a lot more work. I won't go there too, too in depth. But anyway, three different ways uh, opaque walls manage water. We have um, mass walls, we have barrier walls, and we have cavity walls. We don't see a ton of mass walls anymore, but really relying on the thickness of the assembly and the storage capacity of the assembly to resist the water penetration. It's meant to absorb and hold water, and then the water evaporates before it reaches the inner surface. Uh, sorry for that ringing, we better. Barrier walls, uh, we're relying on a perfect outer surface, including the joints. Um, and we all know that nothing's perfect, so this is not the ideal assembly. Um, the cavity wall system, which is what we're going to be talking about most, is the rain screen approach. It includes that redundancy where the outer cladding um, uh, manages, no, I shouldn't say manages, it blocks a lot of the rainwater, but the rainwater that does bypass the cladding gets managed by the weather resistive barrier or air barrier behind it and includes flashing and weeps to get the um, rain or the water out of the assembly. So we'll be talking about uh, for opaque wall mostly this the cavity wall systems. So code requirements for walls um, thankfully codes say that we need to manage water. They want us to make sure buildings don't leak so they require uh, weather resistive barriers and drainage behind veneers. Um, there's an exception there for concrete or masonry walls that um, have been tested by E331 to resist them uh, without a weather resistive barrier. Um, and then they give a, the codes also tell us what they consider a weather resistive barrier to be, something that obviously resists liquid water penetration. So pretty. Uh, self-explanatory, I believe, but um, what they say a weather resistive barrier is equivalent to uh, one layer of number 15 asphalt felt as a minimum. 
And then there's certain documents that tell you how to meet at least that minimum level. So going into um, more detail on cavity walls and the opaque wall specifically, um, we have what I'll go through four uh, parts of an opaque wall, the cladding itself, the drainage cavity behind the cladding, the drainage plane, which is the weather resistive barrier, which is usually also an air barrier, and then the flashing and weeps, which is to collect the water and get it out of the system. So starting with the cladding, um, this is really pretty simple stuff, I think, but it, it goes wrong quite a bit. And this is one example, the one concept, control water entry due to gravity. So we all know gravity takes things in. And in this example, I should have put the detail on the left here, but the, they show you know, a slope to the sill flashing to get any water within the curtain wall system out. Well, in construction with tolerances for masonry and concrete, things got set a little wrong and we have a reverse lap that's actually directing water into our curtain wall system. Um, also, they show here end dams, which we'll get into on flashing, but that's to make sure water doesn't run off the ends and get dumped into the sides and direct water at certain spots, which increases. Is that better? Sorry, I know I'm ringing. Maybe I'll just hold it. Um, so we need end dams, and we'll get into that in the flashing section. Uh, also, avoid reverse laps. We, gravity, again, if you have a reverse lap, it lets the water in. So we want to, we want to have a good shingle. Um, control of water entry due to surface tension. So water tends to cling to surfaces. So what we want to do is put in drips so that water hits the drip and goes out instead of rolling under and in. So here. Oops. Here's an example of a drip on a uh, stone sill. We have a little undercut there. Those are really, really important. You see a lot of those in precast overhangs too. You have a cut drip on the underside so that water doesn't roll under. It clings to the surfaces and then it uh, has more wetting here. So if we include this drip, this stays drier. We can also incorporate sheet metal drip edges on flashing so that Water doesn't roll off and hit this, it drips and your brick absorbs less water. Let's see, control of water due to capillary suction. So this will, we'll go into what capillary suction is in the uh, building science section, but basically in concept, we wanna use materials with less absorption, um, use open joints that are wider than 10 millimeters um, or if we have closed joints, make sure they're intact. So anything like a sealant joint with bond separations or mortar joints that have slight cracking, they want to pull that water actually in. Um, an example of an open joint rain screen where that doesn't uh, allow that capillary action. Control water at the cladding level from kinetic entry. So. Um, this is a classic example of a rain screen joint that's designed really well. So it has the back dam, it has the sloped edges, um, it has the shingled overlap joint, so um, just preventing rain from driving in. So moving on from the cladding design to the drainage cavity but right behind the cladding, <clears throat> we want to make sure it's continuous to allow that water to actually flow out and not bridge over to our uh, weather barrier. We want to keep as much water off of the weather barrier as we can. So um, first line of defense cladding, and then we have a drainage cavity. Uh, second line would be our weather barrier. Um, drainage cavities are oftentimes vented, so if you think about a brick cladding, we have open cell vents at top and bottom to help remove moisture. We also have ventilated cavities, uh, which allows a little bit more significant amount of airflow to promote drying by vapor movement and also reduce wetting. So um, 
this is a, sorry. I thought I had an example of a ventilated rain screen in here, but um, the other thing you wanna do for cladding is to help reduce rainwater penetration is make the joints as, as large as you can to promote ventilation behind, but then have a really, really tight air barrier behind it, which minimizes the pressure differential across your cladding. And that helps to minimize the amount of uh, water penetration across the cladding. So open joint rain screen with a really tight air barrier helps to, resist, helps to prevent water from actually getting back to that drainage plane. So getting into the drainage plane, I only have one slide on this because like I said, I talked about it a lot in the air barrier section. We, um, it's a lot more easy to make, it's a lot easier to make a, a water barrier than it is an air barrier. So we talked about how to make that con continuous uh, an hour ago, but basically for a weather resistive barrier, really a couple things to consider. Um, as I mentioned with cladding, similar to that, they need to be shingled and you need to have adequate overlap at the joints. You need to have a sloped correct. So if we have some surfaces that aren't vertical, make sure we slope them so we get the water out. They need to be continuous. Um, they need to be detailed at penetrations to show how we're managing the water. Uh, lots of different materials can be a weather resistive barrier. You have ha house wrap, you have felt, um, water resistant sheathings, self adhered membranes, and so forth. Like I said, oftentimes they're the air barrier. So moving on, um, the weather resistive barrier, uh, water barrier, whatever you want to call it, is integrated with flashing. So that, um, that cavity is going to be interrupted by shelf angles, by windows, by grade, by a number of elements. And what you need to do is at all of those interruptions in the cavity, we need to have a flashing that can capture the water and, and drain it out. Um, so flashing extends from, from the weather resistive barrier across the drainage cavity, across the veneer and out and there's weeps in that flashing to allow the water to get out. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have end dams at flashing so that the, the water can't roll off the flashing and be directed into um, into concentrated area, areas, which could be more susceptible to water leakage. Uh, we have lap joints that we need to think about, how are flashing lap joints detailed so that water doesn't travel laterally underneath of them. Um, we just basically really need to think about how flashing is detailed to really manage the water. That's a lot of times where you're gonna see things go wrong. And here's an example of a, um, a detail that we saw in a design review. And again, I, I just keep saying this, thinking three-dimensionally, because <clears throat> in a design review, that's really important, because it's easy to think about two-dimensionally how things look um, in a one-section cut. But what happens beyond, and this is an example of this, where so we're looking at a, a terrace <clears throat> where there's a waterproofing membrane on the concrete deck that comes in, and it ties into the curtain wall. Is that? Not in the right spot, Brian, I don't think. I can't see it, but yeah, it's too far outboard. It needs to have the sealant joint right there. But what you're, what's that? Yes, right where there's insulation. Yes. <laughs> so what I'm looking at though beyond is the curb. So there's a parapet for this rooftop or this terrace beyond, and they're showing the counter flashing for the roofing system. And that counter flashing is above the level of the curtain wall, which actually continues. So this, <clears throat> this parapet comes and meets the base of the curtain wall. Well, if you understand how a curtain wall manages water, everything drains here. So at that parapet, it, water could be trapped. And you also, if you ever had to maintain your curtain wall, <clears throat> you can't get, get to it where this um, snap cover is because the parapet is in front of it. So thinking three-dimensionally really, really helps. And I've said that way too often. Um, shelf angle details get really important. 
Uh, we want to extend our flashing. So flashing termination is here in this case. So flashing starts from the face of the cladding, comes up onto the backup wall, the weather resistive barrier, in this case air barrier, laps over top, termination bar sealed. Um, one thing, you have a cavity protection material here, and that's for brick masonry cladding. During installation, we have a lot of mortar droppings, and that is intended to allow water to get to the flashing and out. But what we want to do is try to bring that flashing up higher than the cavity protection material is helpful, um, just to give it a little bit more protection. You also, a lot of times we see um, flashing that extends across the cavity. If it's not supported, <clears throat> it'll sag and that allows water just to sit there. So we like to, I, I like to see flashing come up and then have the continuous insulation sloped a, a bit and then the cavity, ex, or the flashing extend high to just to give it continuous support across that drainage cavity. So this is an example of what not to do with flashing. Um, in this case, it just felt, so these are those mortar droppings I was talking about. <laughs> not good, it lets water that bypasses the brick and it will bypass the brick bridge over to your backup and penetrate to the inside. The flashing just fell down, not doing anything for us there. In this case, the laps are almost non-existent. It's not adhered. Um, it's actually up here, it's starting to sag from the backup wall. Um, detailing flashing splices is important. Um, obviously, water that reaches that flashing level tra traverses laterally and it's in at that point. Um, bolts, in this case, just cut over a shelf angle bolt. That's not a good detail. Saddle flashing. So <clears throat> one detail to always look out for in your design reviews is where parapets terminate into walls above. So getting the flashing on your parapet to the backup wall, not to the cladding. Because in this case, like I said, water is gonna bypass the brick cladding once it gets to the, the interruption, it's into your roofing system here. So if we detailed everything and thought about construction sequencing and got this flashing back to the weather resistive barrier on the wall, the, the brick wall, then we'd have a watertight detail that's also airtight. This is an air leakage issue as well. So this is a, a better way to do it, super complicated, but you can see how things like these should be thought about. So getting our, our parapet flashing, roof flashing back to the backup wall of the wall above. I mentioned end dams a couple of, does everybody know what an end dam is? <clears throat> yeah, this, well, th that's one right there. This is an example where there is none, obviously, and water that's coming on here just rolls off the end and dumps right here, and that's a lot more susceptible to water leakage. We wanna put end dams on to, to keep the water on the flashing and make sure it's directed out of our, of our wall system. Here's a couple of photos of end dams done well. It's integrated really well here with our um, air barrier or weather resistive barrier. We extend it beyond, so this is our rough opening. We make sure it extends beyond our rough opening so that we fully protect that window head. I've had this slide in the air barrier section again, but thinking three-dimensionally about how flashing is detailed and how we end dam. And this is an example of a one we're working on right now where they have <coughs> stacks of basically brick masonry piers adjacent to um, a bunch of curtain wall punched openings. And they put this, what we're calling this aluminum shroud, and this has a whole slew of detailing issues that I'm not gonna get into, but at every floor line there's a shelf angle, and every floor line we, are, we have a flashing. And the question here is, 
so we have an end dam that comes across here, or sorry, upturned back leg coming across here. What happens here? Are they trying to, going to try to transition that upturned back leg back and over and out? Or how does that flashing get detailed where it meets that aluminum shroud? Because we don't really want to, we need the plywood protected. We don't want the water to come here, run off back here and dump down. So a lot of issues on how we make sure that things are end dammed appropriately. And a lot of times when you bring it up in a design review, the response is going to be, we'll figure it out during construction. But if you can think about those things in a little bit in advance, it's definitely helpful to try to resolve some of those issues before going into construction. Here's an example of that where an end dam <coughs> gets detailed. Then, Andre, I think this might have been related to that slide earlier of the water leakage at the condo building uh, with all the storefronts coming in. And this, I think, was the issue is all of those were just open and you have to end dam it to make sure that the water just doesn't roll inward. Yes, it was an end dam. It was an end dam issue. All over. <laughs> Um, paying attention to soffits or overhangs and how to water manage the water at the bottom of these. So you can see sort of the clips for this limestone cladding. <clears throat> well, what happens at the bottom? Is water then just going to sit on top of this? So let's see, we have an aluminum soffit. You have to think about what happens to that water that's being managed at this level. And how do, does it just drip off and then hang out here on top of the metal and just go anywhere? Or do we just want it to, do we want to put a flashing to direct it out? Or do we want to put we, weeps in our, in our uh, aluminum soffit? Here's an example where, again, limestone cladding and they um, epoxied the joint and no flashing at the head. So the question was, how are we managing that water behind the cladding. How are we getting it out of our wall? <clears throat> that could be a durability issue in a, in a freeze-thaw freeze -thaw zone. <clears throat> so on top of flashing, we need weeps to allow the water to get out in a, in, in a cladding system like brick masonry. We need them regularly spaced. We want them directly on top of the flashing and we want them open so they let the water out. So these are examples of really what not to do. So sealing over and clogging up the weep. This weep's too high, so you have to build a head of water for it to get out. This weep is full of mortar. How is it gonna work? And I mentioned weep vents to uh, vent, uh, vent the cladding. Here's an example of where they tried to do that with a weep vent here and here. So this multifunction, it allows some airflow behind the cladding, but it also lets the water out. <clears throat> so getting a, into barrier walls, just a couple of slides. Um, Precast concrete wall systems. Um, you might consider it a mass wall, kind of, but it's also meant to mostly resist the water penetration at the face. But what about the joints? <clears throat> what do we do at the joints? And I mentioned this in the error section a little bit, but this is from um, PCI where they're recommending see the dual stage joint. We have, a, we have a primary and then we have a rain screen. So we have this one that's shielded from the UV. It's got the uh, insulation helping to resist or to minimize the thermal load that this joint takes. Um, but this joint has to be detailed to be continuous. So in architectural details, you wanna show, usually we see dotted lines that show the intent behind how that joint is made continuous. Where we want that joint to weep, it's gotta cross over the insulated panel and it's gotta let that water out that bypasses this outer joint. <clears throat> And it's a similar concept for this is insulated metal panel. And a lot of times you'll see this system directly applied to metal studs. Um, sometimes you'll see a weather resistive barrier, an air barrier behind it. But a lot of times now what we're seeing is 
this insulated metal panel is supposed to do all the work, air, water, thermal, everything. So the detailing of this joint is critical. They call out this outer seal being optional. Uh, a lot of times uh, we recommend that it's done, but sometimes it's not. And then this joint has to do all the work. So how that, that inner joint is detailed is really, really important for these systems. How do you achieve continuity, horizontal to vertical? You can see here they're trying to show how that seal has to come out and bridge to the primary joint. Um, gets really complex. And then how water is managed at the bottom with the base flashing and weeps in the base flashing. So <clears throat> that's mostly opaque walls and just the basics on how to manage water, just transitioning a little bit to fenestration. Um, I don't have too many slides on these because it was mostly covered in the air control section. But again, we have barrier type assemblies that it's, men it's meant to shield all the water at this outer skin. We don't see much of those anymore, but they do exist. Uh, most often you're going to see the cavity wall concept where water is meant to migrate past the uh, outer gasket into a chamber where the water is managed and directed out. Um, so I debated skipping this, but I'll go through it really quick. Uh, back to this uh, NAFS document, what they uh, require or what they recommend is um, for water penetration resistance of windows per ASTM E331 is that uh, RLC and CW be tested to 15, resist 15% 15 of the um, design pressure, and then for AW, 20% of design pressure. For storefronts, 10% um, of design, but not less than 6.24 PSF, and we get one that's up. Sorry, I'll go through that. So we talked about how these manage water because it, it also relates to the air control because they're really one in the same plane. But one of the things to think about for water management of a storefront system is this um, subsill, which is essentially like a through wall flashing that you have to detail to manage water, to hold it, to drain it out. Um, and one of the things you'll see is how to anchor that to, and they just, attach it right through the bottom. Each of those fasteners it could be a water leak. So how do you detail those? Also end dams. You have to think about end dams for storefront uh, subsoil flashing because like a through wall flashing, if water traverses laterally, which it will, and there's uh, like you see, so this is an end dam that's sealed to the subsoil. There's a little bit, a tiny, tiny breach in the, in the end dam. So if you don't have those done really well, it's a water leak. Um, seen that go wrong quite a bit. Another thing to think about is that the window heads and how, when, uh, how the window is anchored. Um, a lot of times they just anchor straight up and here, so it's shown in this detail, anchored straight up. Well, we're gonna have a through wall flashing here. So, Every single fastener is penetrating our through wall flashing. And there's going to be water on top of here. So all of these are locations that are susceptible to leakage. And then I showed earlier um, a similar slide where they you know, instead of anchoring straight up, they have straps that allow you to anchor it further inboard so you're not penetrating your flashing, but then how do you seal around that to make it airtight? So just moving on real quickly to curtain walls. <clears throat> um, curtain walls are have a more uh, stringent requirement, 20% of the design wind load, but not less than 6.24% or 6.24 PSF. Um, this is a baseline performance. Typically, we're seeing things more like 8, 10, sometimes even 15 PSF. And this is a repeat of the slide earlier, but again, that, that um, how this manages water. This, this is that primary air and water line. This is our wet zone. Water 
gets into here and it weeps out. So this is our primary seal. And uh, sometimes what you'll see is that that primary air and water line has fasteners penetrating through it. So in a curtain wall system where it gets horizontals get fastened to verticals, usually at shear blocks at the end, architects don't like to see those fasteners up here. This is traditionally how I've seen it done as of, I mean, recently I've seen more of the fasteners out in here, which that's the wet zone. And so every single one of those fasteners has to be detailed and sealed. Whereas if you put your connection to your shear blocks up on the inside, those are in the dry zone. So you don't have to worry about it penetrating your air and water line. So here they, penetrated that water line. So the question that I didn't include here was, how are these gonna be detailed? But they did get the, they got the plane in the right location. You can see they glazed, they glazed it in. So we, we, we did okay there, Brian. Um, I'm gonna fly through these because we talked about those. So <clears throat> any questions on the walls before I move on to roofs? Yeah. Did you notice that the WRB has to have, uh, I assume it's going to be building code, I didn't see any report. What section of the code is that in? Because in Chapter 14, I didn't see anything about an ICCS report uh, under the WRB section. I don't know. Okay. I don't know off the top of my head either. I didn't see that in the text lab, so mm -hmm. I wasn't sure. <laughs> All right, so we have a lot more to cover in only eight minutes, right? <laughs> so I'll just move through these quickly. Roofs manage water similarly, but tip typically you're going to see a, almost like a, a barrier approach where the roofing membrane is doing all of the work on a low sloped roof. Uh, we have a ton of different roof types built up single ply, SPF, metal panels, hot and fl cold fluid applied, a ton of different roofing types, and even more types of substrates and components that go into a roofing system. We have vapor retarders, insulation, cover boards, substrate boards, and so forth. <clears throat> this could be a whole presentation. It's highly complex, but just in general, what we wanna do is make sure we have enough slope so that we minimize the amount of water that uh, the amount of time that an opening has water on it and avoid the ponding. So in this project, there's a ton of ponding and didn't go so well. Uh, we want quarter inch per foot slope or better. We want to make sure we depress our drains into sumps, um, use saddles and crickets to make sure to get the water to the drains. Uh, protect our terminations, and a couple examples of that not gone well. They just rely on sealant at the leading edge, which usually you want a termination bar with flashing and counter flashing to protect that edge. Here at the vertical edges of roofing systems, a lot of times those are the susceptible locations where they just kind of put some sealant there. And in the other locations, so here we have a termination bar, and then there's a receiver for a counter flashing that actually further protects that edge. <clears throat> Thinking about um, what goes on during construction, a lot of times they put the roof in pretty early on so they can get the building in the dry and then we have trades walking all over it to store materials and, um, and build up towers and all sorts of things. So punctures and damage during construction or even during you know, the installation process, missing some weld, we need continuous uh, a continuous membrane to resist that water leakage. Um, if drains get clogged, we need secondary drains. We don't want to fasten through upward facing surface, eight inch minimum flashing heights, and detailing the penetrations. Temporary seals during construction are really important. Um, I have a handful of projects right now where this didn't happen, and it rains during construction and water flows laterally into the roofing system. And now 
it's trapped in there and it tries to dry and it wets the entire roofing system and it all has to be replaced because the whole system is full of water. Um, so things like what are, how are leading edges protected during construction? Temporary, um, don't, don't allow the temporary flashing. This is masking tape that was there, I think, for two months before they made it final. <clears throat> Storing materials, this is getting a little bit into construction moisture, but building this moisture into your roofing system is not going to go well. Um, protecting it, so walkway pads, putting uh, protection under materials that are being stored on the roof. Um, and then integration with the air barrier or the fenestration, as I talked about in the last section. Sloped roofs. Um, just in general, it's more like a cavity wall that the shingles are the first line of defense and then the roofing felt or the paper or the underlayment is the second line of defense. Um, provide more slope is better so that the water gets off of the roof more quickly. Make sure you overlap your shingles so that water can't. So for example, in the climate I live in, um, the ice dams are a big deal. Water gets forced up under there and then you get a leak. Um, below grade waterproofing. I'm moving really fast through here, but hopefully these are broad general concepts for water leakage. We have different tons of different types of below grade waterproofing similar to roofing, but in general we have positive side which is on the wet side, and then we have negative side, which is on the dry side. Um, and in general, the concept is remove the moisture first. Um, we want to slope the grade of at least 5% near the building edge, connect our downspouts into the perimeter drain systems, provide free drainage material that allows the water to get to the drain tile, and then um, include the drainage pipe at the perimeter of the foundation wall. Slope the drainage pipe so that it gets the water away. Um, surround the drainage pipe with filter fabric and a granular material. And then we also want to protect with waterproofing. So detailing this waterproofing can be really important, uh, or is really important when their um, groundwater level is high enough. So lots of different types of waterproofing, fluid applied, sheet applied, bentonite, a whole other presentation. We're just gonna get into kind of general concepts. Obviously they need to be continuous. They need to resist uh, water. They need to um, resist the soil contaminants. Um, and they have to be able to perform in a wet environment, constantly wet. <clears throat> So we're going to typically, especially in a high-end commercial construction or even when uh, gr uh, groundwater level is high enough, you're going to have it on your, all your below-grade walls, your footings, your slab on ground, and then you're going to have penetrations through that that need to be detailed. We also have water stops as part of our system that uh, you want to install at cold joints. And then you have to protect your waterproofing system with um, a drainage mat or capillary break. So issues with below grade waterproofing, continuity. We don't have great laps. We have uh, fish mouse at laps. We don't have staggered laps. Penetrations are a big deal. Having penetrations like this, how do you detail them? Can be a challenge for sure. Looking at um, transi transition details, so how to go from wall, which is a um, positive, well, they're both positive side, but this then is blind side. So blind side installed before the concrete, then integrated with the positive side on the walls. And how do you, how do you detail those? We have a water stop here. And again, under slab all the way around the footing and up the wall. And those are usually a combination of a, at least a couple of different types of systems. So you have to think about how those two meet. And then the continuity with the above grade uh, air barrier. 
And then I think last but not least, expansion joint transitions. I included this for just a little bit of humor actually to wake you all up. But um, we had an expansion joint coming across the roofing system up the parapet and then it stopped. It didn't go anywhere else. And we said, well, you, not, you need to get that connected to the wall water or wall expansion joint, which was an MCL uh, compressible expansion joint. So there was no expansion joint within the roofing system. They just stopped it. What they did, they installed their um, sheet metal coping and then put roofing membrane over top of that shaped like an expansion joint to say that, oh, we did it. <laughs> so this is the wall expansion joint. They never, ever met, so they had to tear that apart and do it. But this was an interesting one. At the very beginning in the, in the design review, we said, how are these two meeting? They're, you know, one's a PVC expansion joint, one's a MCL wall expansion joint. How do these two integrate? And then way after late into construction they tore a bunch out and tried to make it and this is on the other end of that expansion joint the expansion joint comes over makes a jog comes up and then it just stops and then there's the wall expansion joint so like there's a funnel into the building so how do those two meet really important to figure those things out and then again below grade waterproofing how do those how do the two come together there's the wall and then no, no expansion there. And that is gonna just allow water to just dump right in. And we have a lot of different types of water leakage tests uh, for field verification. We're gonna talk about some of the lab tests in a little bit, but there's all sorts of things you can do to check for water leaks and highly recommend doing a bunch of these. Um, testing the sill pan flashing, testing that, oh, this is a cool test, testing the masonry wall drainage. This is trying to test that flashing to make sure it's getting the water and directing it out. Uh, testing that the roofing system is a big deal. And with that, <clears throat> my la the last slide we have while my voice is going out. Um, control layers are a big deal. We covered so much information, I know, um, but it's really important to get those right, managing air, water, thermal, vapor, uh, really important to performance. Continuity is really important. Um, thinking, I said a bunch of times, thinking three-dimensionally is really uh, how to uh, in, help be a little bit more successful in making these continuous. Um, and then um, one of the things that I think is really important is communicating with all the players, the architect, the owner, the contractors, everybody involved with the with the enclosure about the importance of each layer and how the continuity is really key. And that's it. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Yeah, luckily I don't do a lot of steep slopes, <laughs> steep slope <laughs> system. But I, I, a lot of the ones I've seen that you know the attic is ventilated, mm -hmm. so the air barrier becomes the ceiling plane. Going across yes, across so you're going across, across and Otherwise, down. Otherwise, when you walk into the roof system, you it becomes a. Deck or it's a comp. Then, then it's more, more of a compact. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> is, I mean, it's another thing, like, you need to define your enclosure boundary, because is the attic part of your boundary, or is it considered ventilated out, outdoor space? Right. So if it's a conditioned space, you can bring that air barrier out, up, and you'd have a compact roof assembly. <clears throat>